Uh, afternoon. We, I was told just before, um, so do you want to go the full 50 minutes? And I went, definitely not. What is this? 30 minutes. You're all good with 30 minutes. We've got, um, we've got a, I think there's one more session, so we're at the end of the, uh, end of the road. It's been some interesting stuff. So today uh, we have a, uh, a great panel. One of them, uh, uh, Bo from Samsung, had a call from the Korean president, uh, his Korean president, not the Korean president. Um, <laughs> and he had to go and do what you have to do for your Korean company president. So he's not here, unfortunately. He had some, um, he had some good stuff, uh, which I'm going to channel Bo. So uh, good luck with that, Paul. But he's got some interesting thoughts, and we, we'll, um, we'll get into that in a minute. But because we have um, a couple of interesting characters on the, on the panel, I wouldn't say character, I should say people, <laughs> right? Um, people who have uh, gone to other parts of the, the sector. And of course, we have Karen at the end, who's now at KPMG, an ex-media agency. And we have Dan, who's also uh, an ex-media agency, who's gone to... Uh, you can say I can say it, Facebook. So um, <laughs> what I thought we'd just do is first up, because it's really interesting, um, you know, we, we talked earlier in the, uh, about consulting firms and so forth. So Karen, just, just give us a little uh, sense, one year in, one year what's in. it like, because I'm saving you a thousand people to ask you the same question, yeah. we're going to do it on stage. Going from agency to consulting firm, um, are you smarter? <laughs> I don't know about that. I, I'm surrounded by a lot of really smart people, so that's quite great. Is but, that um, different? <laughs> mm, some, yeah, look, it's, it is, it's just different because your exposure is to a broader level of, of business. So, you know, I, I ask questions at times around, um, you know, what, what, very early on someone said to me, I asked them a question around AI, and the answer they said to me was, is it a project over 10 million or under because they're different teams? So I kind of <laughs> went, right, I'm in a totally different world. Um, the adjustment is profound, so I probably had underestimated how different it would actually be. Um, but 12 months on, I'm thrilled that I'm there. The work that I get to do is hugely interesting and very, very broad. And the trade-off, I guess, is I don't get the Friday night drinks trolley, so, and some of the <laughs> cultural stuff that I really enjoyed, so, but I enjoy the work immensely, so. Are the margins better? I work for a business that makes money and, um, and it's actually a, a really interesting um, business to be a part of and the focus on delivering you know, high value projects to clients and what clients will pay for that um, is, is, is really great. Like it, and I feel that I've now got a seat back at the table with the C-suite that perhaps had sort of dissipated over the years I've been in agencies that, that had been changing. So, you know, I remember when I first started, you were always in with the CEO, you were always in with the CMO. And I think towards the later part of my um, career at a more senior level, the access had changed. And you would expect the reverse. And now I actually am back in that place again, which is lovely. Great, uh, so, and we, we'll come back to sort of agency models and so forth. Uh in the next 24 minutes. Um, Dan, Facebook, so you made the move last year, right? So uh, why and what's happened since? What you, ha what's your observations? Uh, it's funny actually because Karen and I actually were talking about this um, earlier on in the week and um, the biggest uh, kind of observation is very similar is that you, the reason that I got into the business was to try and solve problems for clients. Um, and as you get into, my role was in general management and investment, you tend to be dealing a lot with people um, pitching, p and that kind of stuff. Um, and I'd lost a little bit of connection with solving business problems, being in touch with the C-suite, as Karen said, and those kind of elements. And, and, and I've kind of got that back in a, in a more of a consultative manner, and we're fortunate enough to have that opportunity um, being at Facebook. But it was really interesting listening to Turles when she was up here, and um, uh, media agencies are still a very uh, manual, um, optimizing, constantly buying, transacting um, level, which means that you've got a whole raft of people with an agency from very junior through to very senior. Um, and that means that there's always kind of complexity, there's always issues. Um, and because we're a self-service platform in, in Facebook, you have a bit more time and a bit more space to have uh, broader business challenge conversations with clients. Right. At, at a higher level, even at Facebook, you know, with your clients, you're you talking about their business that's beyond a media it becomes, a, you know, we work on business solutions, yeah. um, which is, you know, I think, where agencies want to be at um, and where I think they're capable of getting to, but uh, there's probably 
um, not as many uh, people leaning into that model as, as, as they would like it to be. Right, which is, gets us to really the, the thrust of this, this conversation uh, around media effectiveness and do we have a, a, a media effectiveness crisis and uh, brand management. Now, uh, you, know, you, you know, I sit there from the outside and I'm, I'm no um, uh, clever insider on this stuff, I sit from the outside. And when you look from the outside, you see, uh, and for 10, 15 years I've heard, you know, the iterations. So we started off one to one in the 90s and we had CRM and then we went through a whole bunch of uh, MarTech and AdTech and everything, everything programmatic. All these things were going to uh, make everything better, make things work better, make things um, more efficient or effective. And in fact, uh, we're still talking about some of the struggles we, we, we had 10 or 15 years ago with the technology. Um, so I guess my premise is actually, I think we are, you know, we've created lots of more different things, but have we got any better at it? No, is my premise. Um, and I, I want to get your guys' perspective on it. And we'll start down, down, down that end, um, Karen, particularly yeah. around, say, let's talk, start with performance, short term, long term. Yeah. You got a view on dashboards yeah. and a whole bunch of things there. Just start there in terms of, are we actually are we, we saw, we'll see what today, addressable TV, um, it's going to make it better. I, you know, programmatic was a thing for me five years ago that the vendors were saying as a, as a journo, they're telling me this is going to be great for publishers, it's going to make more margin yield. Well, bollocks, it didn't happen at all. We've gone the <laughs> absolute other way. And uh, so we've got, have we got more of that coming? So I think that you know a lot of clients have gone out and, and said we can now access more information around our business than ever before, and they've rolled out you know a number of you know fast measurement metrics, dashboards, solutions. We can get sales information at our fingertips. People pick up their phone, they can look at what's happening in their business, and and that's all great. But what and, and it's important to have that, but I think it's also really important to have the complementary part of that, which is brands aren't built in a day. So it takes a while for brands to build. You know, you, you start advertising with television, it doesn't actually turn on immediately. It reach builds over time the more that you spend. So if you're making these decisions off the back of what happened yesterday from a sales outcome and not looking at the longer term and bigger picture, I think it's a real challenge. Um, we're doing one project at the moment with a client, which is basically how do we get their board to understand the long-term benefits of building brands. And, and we're sort of going in there and helping them, I guess, build a case around that and, and talk to, at a board level uh, from an independent view so that the focus shifts away what from What does that conversation term. sound like? <laughs> Look, it's, it's, we're just kicking off with this one actually and, um, and we're currently looking at all of the activities that they've undertaken and they've done a lot of this stuff. They've done market mix modelling, they've got dashboards, they've got all of these things going on. So really focused on trying to get the measurement side of it right. Um, the, the problem is, is there's an education part to this at a board level to say you need to invest in a business long term so that customers will, will stay there. So in this one we're looking at a number of external studies, we're comparing where they are, we're looking at internal marketing benchmarks from companies that we've worked with, and then we're going back and giving the board a, a view to say, you're doing this, best practice looks like this, you've ticked these boxes and into the future, um, we think that you should do a few Are more. you trying to get them to change some of the dials? We're trying to, trying to, well, to be honest, we're trying to get them to back um, the CMO and in investing in the business and not actually knee-jerking and pulling money out. Right. You know, and I think that's a, you know, that's one of the things that's quite difficult. You know, everybody knows when, when um, bottom line's not doing well, people come to marketing because they can access that money quite quickly and, um, and they can't take it from other areas of the business. Uh, we're just trying to get the board to understand the importance of that. Um, yeah, longer good. term part. Ness, you're, you're, you're in, at the front line of this, your client briefings and so forth and the sorts of media you're having to buy and the sorts of the KPIs and what you're getting measured on, uh, long term, short term, effective. Uh, am I talking rubbish when I say we've sort of just got lots more numbers but not necessarily better results? I wouldn't say that it's numbers versus results. I think it's not short term versus long term either. Um, I think there's absolutely a undercurrent that we need to focus back on long term. Um, and if we think about the reasons why we got there in the first place, or, or this short-termism that we refer to, um, it came from sort of GFC time. Was we saw this huge, big change where it was, you know, people didn't have the money. The budgets were coming out really quickly. CMOs were really defensive um, about the money that they were spending, or had to justify the, every dollar they were spending. And so to do that, to have that instant gratification that I spent a dollar here and something happened over here, um, pushed really hard due to economic 
factors more than anything else. Um, I think what we have in the last couple of years is actually more environmental factors around um, CMO tenure. So really, it's a really important thing, um, where it's it's a lot shorter than it's ever been, and it's the shortest of the C-suites. Um, so you're talking to CMOs versus a CEO or a CMO will usually stay in a business in a short amount of time. Um, and the pitch cycle is insane. It's the, the shortness of um, our, how often we're pitching um, for clients is also reduced. So if you look at those two economic factors too, um, the five years or 10 years or whatever it might be, or 20 years or 50 years to build a brand um, is not as, as measurable and individual success. So, so I don't think it's a versus. I think we need to understand why we got there and we need to understand um, both from the CMO, from the publisher, from whatever it might be, that it takes time to do those things and we need to start having the conversations for sure, as we are with every single um, brand in the building. Um, but the idea is, is really predominantly on not versus. So you don't drop one for the other. So is it changing, what, but has that changed, or how has that changed where you spend? If you've got a performance bent to everything, you're a higher performance uh, weighting to your... Not at all. I mean, we often talk about outcomes for sure. We talk about being able to turn around and look at a marketing outcome rather than a media outcome, which is probably the difference of the change. Where instead of being focused on things like a click-through rate or a, in this case a, a TARP or whatever it might be, we're focused on the objective of what happened for the client. But has it changed the channel allocation though? No, but I'm not sure it should. I, I, but I don't think it starts at the channel. It yeah. starts at what you're trying to achieve. And if you're trying to achieve long-term and short-term in combination, you need to determine how you build a campaign, how you build it. And the channel is the last piece. TV can build brand, TV can do direct response, digital can build brand, digital can do direct response. You need to believe in that and get it right up front before you start choosing the channels. They're just the execution point. And I think that's the big change here is I don't think... Hi, Nick. Hello. I'm your son. I didn't work for an agency, I'm so there, I so didn't do an agency. introduction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, sorry, Nick, I don't have one either. Uh, you're, <laughs> you've got the, you're the end. You're the jockey that's going to the race. Oh, I don't want to. I, I, just quickly on that, I don't think you can turn around and blame essentially programmatic and digital media in the new ways that we work on short-termism. I think that those... Um, platforms um, enable shared to I was going to say, it's happened. never been yeah. before. Yeah. Um, but I think the business pressures around the day-to-days of business allocation, budgetary allocations, all those different things, are, they, are the impetus for that short termism. It's just the programmatic and the digital platforms enable that at a far quicker pace than they've ever done. It's very short-term in TV. On, I'm talking linear TV booking at the moment. Um, and that's following through on the business pressures that marketeers mostly have. But, but um, Dan, you, you say that you know, it's not about the channel, but if we think about the historical, maybe, maybe it's changing now, particularly with Facebook and, so, and, and, and Google, it might be changing a bit, but, but the, the, digital, and the digital scene was very much about we can prove a result faster now, we can show you some measurement and we can get an impact. Now, whatever that, is, whatever that action is that you're getting, that was a very, very <coughs> big push by the emerging digital economy for at least 10 years. I would say, you say GFC, I'd argue that combination of GFC and this notion of the, the, digital, the emerging digital economy needing a point of difference and saying, we can show you some results. Now we can prove and demonstrate some stuff that took, took away from the long-term thing. I would, tell me why I'm wrong. So it, it's around what you're trying to achieve on the, on the platform. So if you get what we call a signal, where you can actually prove a sale or a conversion or whatever that is, it's very easy to optimise in digital channels to kind of get to that point. I agree with you, 10 years ago, a lot of the thinking was around that kind of last click. So the attribution was on that last piece of the panel and there wasn't this thinking around full funnel uh, in terms of how you build a brand to get to that point. I think a lot of that has moved on. I don't think people are thinking about that. I think people can and they do, but predominantly people aren't thinking that way. So. I think now everybody kind of understands that it's not just around attributing um, you know, Google search to that sale. Um, when you look at brand, where you don't have signals, and it's more around the layering of, uh, of all the different channels together, using market mix modeling, using um, uh, brand testing, all of those metrics to work out the sum of all of the channels, of which TV is one, digital is one. That's where you need to get the thinking around brand and optimizing to outcomes. So are, you, are the digital players, that say, that say Facebook, doing more of that because it is peaking in the performance stakes? Is it, you actually need to broaden your, broaden your uh, agenda as well? I don't think anyone's ever thought that it's very, very difficult to deliver at the end of the funnel if you don't have a brand at the beginning. You need to be able to build that brand to build it and put it down at the end. So, Karen, I'll go back to you on um, the 
digital platforms or digital um, performance, you've got a, an interesting example with an SME because one of the things that talks about you know uh, with Facebook and Google is that mo a, a big swag of your clients are actually small, medium-sized enterprises, Absolutely. right? So the big brands are there, but it's actually the, the the driver of your growth and the underpinnings of your business are actually smaller players. And and the argument there is that f forget your theory; these guys are on here because they're, they're building businesses um, on our platform. Um, so I think you, like, there's a good yeah. example here of where that's at, Karen. For yeah, you. so I have a girlfriend of mine who's been building a business over the last seven years and it's become incredibly successful and she's pretty much built it fundamentally through activating social channels, a lot of it through Facebook. Um, and we had a conversation towards the back end of last year. She's just got a whole lot of equity funding. They've bought half of a business. It's very exciting times for her to scale. And she's like, you know, no one really knows my brand. So, and her acquisition through social is starting to taper off. And this is that thing around, you know, what's the right mix about getting acquisition and building a brand and the brand standing for something. And at that point in time, we were having a conversation and she said, there's two avenues for me in this. In this. I can start to build my brand off the platforms that have grown my business because the growth is starting to slow. Or I can go and do the same thing in other countries. Where do I go? And it was a really interesting question, and, I, and knowing that this, this um, business has had this support of, of buy, and I was like, I think you should do both, because longer term, not building your brand in Australia and having, a, 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 I guess, a tapering off leaves you really vulnerable to other, other clients coming in, replicating a business model or something similar, and choosing that over you if they have got a brand that, that stands for something. Um, and then, of course, you know, like she's been hugely successful here. So why wouldn't you go to a larger population? So I was like, if you can do both, give it a cr give it a crack, you know. And that's what she's starting to do. She's looking at what she's going to do and, and where she goes beyond social. Mm. And she's just gone into the UK. So how's that gone into the UK, right? And so in, when, when, she, when you talk about building brand, I mean, that's a longer term play. But what does that mean for her, for her, for SME? Yeah, look, it's it's an interesting one. We had a bit of a conversation around television. Um, and Great the role that television brands. for yeah <laughs> and like, bod and bod not, not the yeah, only thing honest, to build it, you know. no not the only thing <laughs> in that a joke is but I mean we saw yeah. Karen Nelson Field and um, the Lesbian A work and all of those it cool. is the primary channel for building is. brands especially yeah, TV and bod and I just like to say on, on the point that Dan make is he's absolutely right we need a, a good media mix. Mm. But from my perspective, and working in both industries, significantly TV and digital, it's, the, it use, it's that TV first approach that you build a schedule from to deliver a good campaign. Yeah. And I, 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 I'm going to add to that. I work with uh, FMC advertisers. Predominantly, they are brand advertisers. Um, and TV has been the building block for a lot of them. And what we're finding is that um, you know, TV does do, undeniably do a fantastic job at, at building brands, particularly in that long-term space. Um, but what we're finding um, from independent research, be it analytics partners, uh, be it Millwood Brown, all of those kind of um, sort of sales modeling and techniques, we are part of that because TV audiences, particularly between and 20 and 30-year-olds, are coming off. That's not to say that TV doesn't play a fantastic role and is the building block for brand. You just need to supplement it, and every channel multiplies up together to build a brand together. Um, you can't do it all by yourself, and we're not saying we can do it by ourselves. Um, it needs to be a combined approach. Which gets us to measurement, Ness, and, and, and who do you believe? Um, TV's put out some, some, some big numbers today. I don't think you, yeah. I think you might have missed the Karen's presentation. I did, but, but I know the rest But you've probably seen yeah. some of the earlier work. Um, how do you, where do you go for look, finding the, the, the truth serum in, um, in the claims? Because he's got some pretty, you know, he's has some pretty good stuff, these guys. I think the first is we have to stop, like I said it before, we have to stop using the word versus full stop. Yeah, exactly. It is not performance versus digital. Sorry, performance versus brand. It is not TV versus digital. It's not a thing. And I don't mean just the word in itself. I mean the way that we act in the industry as a whole. We have traditional businesses um, that are attacking something that is actually future for them. You know, if you go back 10 years ago, and I won't say all TV, but most TV businesses didn't admit that digital was a thing. They thought they, it, was, it was quite a, a negative thing. Yeah, and vice yeah. versa. And now vice now you find a lot of Plenty of digital Radio building, same, TV is out of yeah. home, same, yeah. all of those areas. So, so my thought process is one is everything's going to be digital. So the yeah. more whether we like it or not, um, other than maybe newspaper. Um, but if we keep going down this route of verses, we're versing ourselves. As a broadcaster, we're versing ourselves. We're confusing the absolute crap out of our clients with this the kind of conversations um, that are happening, and most of them are driven by individual agenda. Um, so if we drop individual agenda and focus on what the client actually needs more as a whole, then I think we're all going to end up in a better place. Than well, the they're fair points, the but everything answer my bloody question, which is uh, there is there is a whole bunch of different <laughs> pieces measurement? of research yeah. 
um, that are saying different things or pointing to different um, outcomes or, uh, or benefits. Mm. And um, h- how do you filter through she, that? She did say, answer. She said it needs to be client specific. Um, and what your objectives are as an individual client needs to be where you come from. And that's where you start the conversation and, and you layer the channels on as a consequence. Every, every agenda, whatever the agenda is going to be, the outcome of that research is going to say we're number one. Is it not? Correct. That's, yeah, right. that's where, right. <laughs> so it's about losing the agenda. And, and independent research for sure. We do a lot of it ourselves. Um, we absolutely go off the guidance of, of the, the industry research as well, and we absolutely believe in it. Um, and if you don't, I don't think they're actually comp, um, competing research either. Completely different methodology, completely different reason for the outcome. So when you're talking though about building brand and you have Dan saying building brand at two seconds is fine, and then you have others saying at six or eight or 10, that there is some decisions to make there around brand and exposure. What, what is the, where's the truth? That it's not as simple as that. And if it was, I think you'd have a lot, uh, different, different thoughts going around in CMO's minds. It's not that simple. Because you know what, it might be able to build a brand within two seconds if you've got the right creative. Maybe that does work, right? But if you don't, and you've got, you know, I always talk about an Airwick example, which I think is the easiest one, um, that people might remember where a lady walked into, onto the screen and then off the screen kind of thing, and there was this big, uh, like, Deke kind of thing that followed her was pretty, right? Um, the logo of Airweek didn't come in until the 28th second. Can you build a brand in two seconds? No. But if that logo was up the front and it had something super impactful in the first two seconds, of course you can. So I don't think a piece of research on either side is enough to determine one blanket statement that says we can build brand like this. It is yeah. probably, yeah, I think the, the big thing is um, making sure that there's a real focus around measurement and um, the way that you look at, at measuring everything that you do because there are a lot of different ways to measure things, you know, research, econometric modelling, all sorts of things. Um, I think setting that stuff up front, and if you're a big brand, you need to be actually trying to understand if you change something, what does it contribute? Like, did it did it yeah. sell more things, you know? And, and that's, I think, the critical part to it is just getting that right and making sure that people are actually measuring it. And, mm-hmm. and also knowing that people know how to read and interpret the information mm-hmm. in a way that it works. So. OK, next one, and we're, we're coming down to the wire, but um, again, personalisation, targeting. Nick, you've got some thoughts on this. Um, and we see that, again, it goes back to, it's still around, um, it's, the same, it's the same bucket really as, as uh, long term, short term. But, you know, I get confused because I hear lots of people saying, you know, over target, and you know, you've heard the PNG, Stories on with you and beyond, by the way, um, and so, so your thoughts, Nick, on the on the targeting personalisation. I stuff? think, for, from our perspective, um, from an MCM perspective, we went really heavily. We've got this great data set for for those of you who don't know of MultiView, and we've overlaid that with our purchase behaviour data. And it's a fantastic data set. And um, the first thing that we did with that, and I've got no one else to blame but myself, was go target, create you know tiny little segmentations, and target the hell out of it. And that was the sort of first port of call. And actually, what we realised really quickly was that doesn't shift the dial, and it doesn't actually work. And and I think we learn. And one of the things I love about Australia is we learn, and we look to like the UK and the US and different markets to learn from. But one thing that we always forget here is we're a population of 24 and a half million people. So in reality across both our TV assets and our digital assets, although they're mass reach, you go down age, gender, one consumer segment, anything below that, you are literally four people in Bondi at a CPM of like 20,000. Mm. You know, which I'm fine with, because <laughs> I live in Bondi, and I'll take them around there and knock on their door. And you know, what be, you know what would be a better option? Just stand there with a wobble board. It would, you know, you know. Just go right back to base. And I think that on TVs and certainly, you know, from an MCM perspective, we were really trying to compete heavily with the likes of Google and Facebook in that space. And I think we took away what made us unique and great. TV, I'm talking about, which is mass reach at scale. And shifting the dial for audiences. Yes, the data and the data that we have and the data that now we want to work with clients with to get their data, oh, sorry, give us, give our data to them so that they can target better across our network. It's not about reducing that audience. It's actually just making it just that bit more efficient and effective. That's all. But so if I go to not targeting for targeting sake, not targeting for targeting sake, right? And I'll, I'll come to Dan and seek. But if I go to some of the conferences I go to, which are whether they be Martech players, EdTech players, it's still ta- it's still personalization and targeting and getting at the a, a message, a single message to a single person okay. at the right time, right place. Is f- that that is but what it, happens it, with the narrative? But, but it is extremely effective when you do that. My, the the change I was saying, and, you know, we're heavily involved at this stage around addressability um, and where that leads us. Mine isn't. Oh, sorry, the business isn't around micro-targeting. It's about personalization of creative. 
Mm. So if you've got a fantastic understanding of what your audience does at any given stage, and you can serve them, you know, um, a brand ad across all of those uh, uh, all of those different platforms that we have reaching mass audiences, but you can personalise that message in certain areas, is extremely effective. So mine wouldn't be about just um, serving out an ad to like. 18, 24 year olds that like eggs. It would be about serving out to 25, 50 fold, but trying to personalize that message where possible to get the ma maximum out outcome from it. So not yeah. narrowing the audience, but narrowing the message. Back. Narrowing the message. Yeah. Or just, yeah. uh, just making that message more effective. Because yeah. so you can over target too, right? Absolutely. So, and, and I don't know about anyone in the room, but I often buy things that I never really thought I needed and never really knew that I wanted until I see an ad. And, you know, if you get to a focus and you're trying to identify something, um, you may miss all of that incidental audience that channels like television delivers. And look, I think other digital platforms as well, but it, it is, it's really important that we just don't narrow down so much and then nothing sells. There's a, there's a super philosoph a philosophical question around that, which is, if it looks exactly like the person that's already bought it, were they probably going to buy it anyway? Yeah. And so there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a philosophical yep. kind of, if you go too far... Yeah, and um, that's what I'm... That's exactly the, the point. I think if you, you don't want to do that. Is, you know, if you've got a... $10,000 handbag, you want people to know it's a $10,000 handbag. Hmm. So you want the most people to but see it. But I think if you, if you go back to the... Is that how much your handbag cost, Anne? <laughs> um, not telling. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, look, I think if, if you go back to the, the, the basic principles of Ehrenberg Brass, you, you need to be able to grow a brand by reaching your light um, and just your category mm -hmm. buyers. Yep. Um, and we've seen probably over the last kind of couple of years a lot of that micro-targeting coming back. Uh, and actually being far broader, um, particularly with, uh, with, with sort of CPG as a category um, as a whole. Um, but what it does mean, as per Nick's comment, is actually it means that you're just using personalization at scale, which is a term that we use um, around the creative. So it may be that you have a deodorant product that's generally used by I know, 18 to 25 year old men, but equally there's quite a lot of 30 plus men using it and there's quite a lot of mums buying it in, gross, in the grocery shop as well. So you're actually targeting those people with different creative messages. If you look at all the ads, it's just athletes that use journalism. That's, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Just athletes. <laughs> or or grubby <laughs> Kiwi kids. Um, <laughs> That still doesn't, that's still, so it, I hear you, but the, the uh, conversation that you, you hear a lot from uh, the, certainly around, around the, the digital uh, economy is that, I hear you, but that still talk about targeting, hyper-targeting is, the, is the holy grail. Yeah. That still, it still uh, drives the agenda. Who I think, does? I, think it's, I, think, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I think what you're seeing now is that targeting is being used to minimise wastage around broader audiences. It's not used around micro-targeting. Micro-targeting exists and is very, very successful for small and medium-sized business where you're scaling businesses from a, from a heart. And, and a great example of Karen's there where you know, a single Australian business then has the opportunity to grow locally outwards and outwards to the point that it's selling in, uh, selling in the UK and growing its reach. That's where that targeting capabilities come in. But I don't hear many advertisers talking about hyper-targeting, um, certainly not in uh, And I, I think uh, that's why I said who, who, who do you hear that from? Uh, because I think the people that we The are, vendors, of course. We are still correct. Yeah. Yeah. So but the people, they, again, that are selling those kind of... Yeah. bunch <laughs> of people are listening to the vendors, though. I mean, I was at a conference last week yeah. and there was 700 people and that was back-to-back -back vendors going, the whole thing, and you could see the yeah. clients. So it was all client conversations lapping it up. Um, Karen, your take on, on, on that? on that though? The, the reality of the matter is is that audience is declining um, across all sorts of, of channels, right? And and that places pressure on being able to get incremental costs and CPMs for what you have that's kind of doing other things, right? So if I was a publisher, I'd probably be saying, oh, I can get you, I can find you high value prospects and I'm going to charge you 50% more for it. And I don't blame them for giving it a crack. Um, because I think that you have to be really clever around how you grow your businesses when, when media is fragmenting and the world is changing. And I think you, you kind of have to do that. Now, whether if, that... If it's twice as effective, why wouldn't you pay double for it? And, and, this, and this is the it's thing. It's measurable. Yeah, but I, I guess it, it's got to get that balance right between what will I pay a lot for? I mean, and then the, the flip of that. If, if I was a large insurance company and I blended my database and I took out everybody who already has a, um, has a premium with me, and then I only go and advertise to people who aren't customers, I'd pay a premium for that to not have to talk to my own through an addressable audience. Because I think that, that, that in that case, I'm identifying ideally the prospects that I'm already, I've and already have. So 
I think th there are really clever ways of, of doing that at scale, mm -hmm. okay. um, where you can actually apply that data in a, in a really clever and powerful way. Um, but would I, if I was flogging, you know, if I was going to buy some Kellogg's and stuff like this, I mean, would I really want to find families with kids under under five or whatever else to, to do that? Because, you know, I don't mind a bowl of Nutrigrain myself. So um, <laughs> you've got to kind of be realistic around how that works. So. Okay, so we've, we've got seconds left. Wrap up just yes, no, or a little bit, a little bit of one sentence. So we are getting, we are more effective than they were three to five years ago. Better results, clients are getting more growth. We get, we're doing better than we were three, five years ago. I, Karen. I think people are measuring more than they were, but I wouldn't say we're getting better. Things are changing. We need to get, you know, we need to get a more holistic view of measurement. We're certainly not where we need to be. Um, and it's, it's one of the big focus areas that I've been doing within KPMG is around how do we tighten up measurement in a, in a, in a way that people can feel more confident. Nick, we, we're better and better... I think we know more. Um, I'm not sure we're as good... I think we can go down Rabbit Warren Square quickly in this area. Um, so I think we know more. We have the propensity to be better going forward. Very optimistic, Ness. I think the ecosystem is far more complicated than it's ever been, and I think it's not going to stop getting complicated. Um, so I think we need to stop thinking about agendas and start thinking about the client. Are we more effective? If we think about the client, the client outcome, right? not own agendas. Dan? And just to build on that, I'd, I'd say it's around focusing on the client, but then using the right metrics, using ROI, using sales, using uh, growth of brand that are conversations that a board want to talk about, not around reach and tarps and all those kind of elements. It's got to be around outcomes. I think Hogg said it in the press yesterday around winning the ROI debate. I think as an yeah. industry, we need to win that ROI debate uh, and show how it adds value as marketers and as a discipline for all of us together as opposed to... Uh, that's a completely, that's a big different mindset and skill set thing to do to shift up to that, right? Because we, we talk media a lot, we talk, but um, that's a different language. I think Learn a new language. But I think clients are, some clients are doing it, but yep. we need that to become the standard. Right. Uh, put your hands together for the panel. Thank you. Thank you.